Good evening. Before we ask for your help with the first of this month's cases, some news from last month. You might remember the attack on an 84-year-old market trader, Bill Gallagher, in the entrance of the block of flats where he lives in south-east London. 80 people rang offering information. Two viewers came forward as new witnesses and two more viewers led police to one particular man. As a result, a man is now in custody, charged with robbery and grievous bodily harm. Although Bill Gallagher himself is out of intensive care now, he still is seriously ill. We're all wishing him well. We have some other progress to report and other cases too later in the programme. The island of Orkney is more isolated than almost anywhere in Britain. 45 minutes by ferry from John O'Groats off the northern tip of Scotland. It's not the sort of place you'd expect to see a major crime. And when one happened there this summer, it was a crime that would have been extraordinary anywhere. Would you like to sit down? No, what would you like to drink tonight? Okay, I think I remember who's got what. One chicken tikka. One lamb tikka. I ordered that. Very good. And uh, who's the chicken chat? Oh, that's mine, thanks. When the gunman came in, it looked like a fancy dress. When the gun went off and I realised it, it wasn't, it was a horrible thought to have your children there and not be able to do anything about it. Shamal Mahmood was 26 and from a large and successful family. This was his second time working at the restaurant in Kirkwall, having seen the job advertised in London. We're the murder, the Mummy Atas Indian restaurant. I want you to preserve the scene, Bob. Make sure nothing's disturbed. I'll get an inquiry team together and get to you as soon as possible. The Northern Constabulary covers a vast area. Orkney hadn't had a murder for 25 years and it was necessary to provide support from the mainland. A helicopter wasn't available to me, making it necessary to travel by road 150 miles from Inverness to John O'Groats. We then had to travel by ferry across the Pentland Firth. That's the nature of policing in the Highlands and Islands. So how is the Holmes computer linked to the mainland going? It's almost ready, sir. And what do we know about Mr Mahmood Angus? We know that he's been on the island for about six weeks. He was here last year for about nine months. And what? at that time he was also working in the Mumataz restaurant. Anything more you would like? Uh, not in time. No, no, not just uh, now. He has no enemies that we can find. Uh, and we do know he has got a brother who lives in London. Uh, he was a, a very brilliant student. The family wanted him to carry on with his studies. Uh, we cannot think why it should ha happen to him. He was a very kind-hearted person. The sad thing is that he got killed at a time when uh, he was about to go home and get married to his girlfriend. We require teams to carry out inquiries at our airport and ferry terminals, to conduct house-to-house -house investigations in Kirkwall, and to re-interview all of our main witnesses. Right, Marianne, what I want you to do for me is just if you could go over the events that happened in the restaurant, just in your own words. I was showing two customers to the table, and I was just about to go back for the, up to the bar for the main use, when the door opened behind me, and I turned round to see who it was. And man with a mask on came in. At first I thought it was a choke, but then I saw the gun in his hand as he went past me. He went up to the table where Shemmel was serving the customers. And I heard a shot. I thought he was in to shoot everyone. And he, I heard the door open behind me and he came out and went down the other lane. And the last I saw him was going down the narrow lane at the back of the restaurant. We were driving down Junction Road at about quarter past seven and as we turned into the car park I saw a guy out of the window on my left. He had on dark clothes and had mossy brown hair. As you're aware, the man that went into the restaurant was wearing a hooded sweat top and he had a distinctive stoop. Down here at Junction Road Toilets, which is just down behind the restaurant, 
at about 10 past 7, we have a sighting of a man hanging about outside the toilets shortly before the murder. Well, I was driving along Junction Road, heading towards the pier, and I was about to turn into the Albert Street car park when I noticed this chap just outside the door of the toilets on my left. He was wearing a hooded top, and I noticed he was wearing a balaclava underneath that. Also, there was someone who saw a man walking from the direction of the toilets, across the road, in the direction of the restaurant. George, the people of Orkney are very concerned about this murder. How can they help you with your inquiries? I'm keen for anyone who was in Kirkwall on the day of the murder and who may have seen anything suspicious to come forward. Can you tell me what time of day that was at? Uh, it was about ten past five, and uh, I was about to go down the lane past the Mamacash restaurant when this guy got down in front of me, and he turned to stare at me, which I thought was quite frightening at the time. The way he held his arms was uh, like a bodybuilder. He was in his 20s, about 28, I would say, and his height would have been about 5 feet 8 to 6 feet. This sighting is of particular interest because of the similar physical characteristics to the person seen in and around the restaurant, but at the end of the day, we still haven't established a motive for this crime. I'm always looking for an exit. Daddy, I can't so, see. It's OK, Daddy will take you through and tuck you in. The effect it's had on our family since the incident is one of distrust. Uh, we have had difficulty going out in the evenings. Things are getting better now, and we hope the kids are getting back to normal. It's difficult to take in such a horrendous event. George Goff, in the four months since this happened, you've obviously made extensive inquiries in the Orkneys. Now, how can a national appeal help? Well, we hope to reach the people of Orkney with a visual reconstruction through Crime Watch, uh, which may help to jog their memories. Also, of course, the programme will reach the remainder of Britain, where we hope to uh, contact anyone who has been on holiday in Orkney. Orkney and Kirtwell in particular has a very uh, industrious holiday trade in the summer. Now, I know you haven't got a motive, but there was a possibility of motive in as much as the day before the murder, there was a sighting of an argument going on at the restaurant, the door of the restaurant. Yeah, that's correct. About half past eight the, uh, the night before the murder, uh, witnesses described to us that two people were arguing with the now deceased Shamil Mahmood outside the restaurant in the doorway of the restaurant. Now that may have an innocent explanation, but our inquiry has failed to trace these people. Now, that was Wednesday the 1st of June. If we roll back two weeks, there was a, another site, and this time rather more remarkable, in, in Woods, which are part of the town. Describe what happened there. Well, it's an area known as uh, Parkdale Woods, which is uh, within the town of uh, Kirkwall. Uh, our witnesses described to us that a man was carrying out uh, what appeared to be commando manoeuvres within the woods for no obvious uh, good reason. Again, that might uh, be an innocent uh, pastime, but we would like to hear from the person to have it explained. Obviously, then, we also need to find uh, any other witnesses to, to the man outside the, the public lavatories. And we should explain that while we were filming, it was raining. Actually, the day of the murder, the 2nd of June, it was one of the hottest evenings of the year. Yeah. So his uh, dress would have been most extraordinary, having a collar up, let alone a balaclava. That's correct. The weather was so good that there's no good reason for having a hood up. And the bodybuilder in the alleyway. Now, there's really nothing much to connect him with the crime. You really want to eliminate this man. Again, as we've seen from the reconstruction, this man is of great interest to us, and unfortunately our inquiries to date have failed to trace him, and he hasn't come forward. If he recognises himself from the programme and is prepared to come forward with an explanation, that will be very helpful. OK. Well, if you live in Kirkwall or if you uh, were in Orkney at the time, please call if there's any way in which you can help. The number is 0500 600 600. That's a free call number in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the Orkney Incident Room. That's on 0856 872076. 0856, which is the code for Kirkwall, 872076. Well, now, there are several arrests to report from Photocall. In our programme in May, we asked for help to find an armed robber in the northeast of England. After the programme, three people rang, gave him the same name. A man has now been charged. And in June, we showed the picture of a man wanted in connection with a number of deceptions. After the programme, a couple rang, in, rang him to say they'd seen him on Crime Watch. Last week, a man gave himself up to the police and was charged with offences relating to deception. From last month's programme, no fewer than 40 people rang giving the same name for a man recorded on a security video. An arrest was made five days later, and a man is now awaiting trial on charges of deceptions. 
And there's new information on the second face. Uh, a man had tricked a woman out of her life savings. We showed this picture of a Brian Saunders. As a result of a call to the programme, we now know that his real name is Alan Stephen Johnson, and police have a much clearer picture of him. Mr Johnson has at least ten aliases, though he does tend to use that name Alan, or George, as his first name. Police would like to interview him about 20 offences of deception and burglary, so please ring us if you know where he might be tonight. Now over to Superintendent David Hatcher and to do Detective Constable Jackie Hames for this month's cases. Do you know this man? He's Andrew Brian Martin, and colleagues in Sussex would like to talk to him in connection with the deception. In February 1992, a man befriended a woman and her mother in Haywards Heath. He was very plausible and persuaded them that he had contacts in the stock market. He claimed he could invest their money for them, but last January he disappeared with their life savings. Andrew Brian Martin is 29, six foot with short dark hair. He's got tattoos on both upper arms. If you can help us in any way, please ring us tonight. Do you recognise this gunman? Since July last year, he's stolen thousands of pounds from building societies in the northeast of England. On each occasion, he approaches the cashier and produces a note demanding a specific amount of money. The man is in his mid-forties, about five foot nine, medium build with short grey receding hair. He's usually clean shaven and on one occasion wore a flat checked cap. If you know who he is, please ring us tonight. If you work in the motor trade, you may recognise this couple. They're Andrew Peter Kutz and Suzanne Trounce. Colleagues in Hertfordshire are anxious to talk to them about a series of deceptions in the southeast of England. During the past two years, ex-company cars have been bought at auctions and sold on with false service histories. Andrew Peter Kutz is 30, 5 foot 11 and of muscular build. He's got dark brown hair which is now collar length and he always has a tan. Suzanne Trounce is 25, 5 foot 2, of very slim build with brown curly hair. The pair are sometimes known as Robin and Rachel Parker. If you know where they are now, please ring us tonight. Our colleagues in Cleveland would like to talk to Christopher Thornton Blake in connection with a serious sexual offence. Christopher Blake is 39, 5 foot 8, of stocky build and has a white discoloration patch on his right cheek. If you've seen him or if you can help with any of our other photocall faces, call us now. And here's the number 0500 600 600, that's free call 0500 600 600. In winter, the Lincolnshire village of Chapel St. Leonard's is a sleepy, quiet little place. In summer, the population increases tenfold when thousands of holidaymakers arrive to stay in the numerous seaside caravan sites around the area. One of these sites has been owned by the Badley family for two generations and never has there seemed the need to worry unduly about security. But after the shock of an armed robbery in August, sadly, all that has changed. Our reconstruction begins 11 days before the robbery in Wellingborough in Northamptonshire at a car park in the town centre there. My car stolen. Right, we'll just take some details then. Could you give me the make and the registration, please? It's Ford Fiesta DAV 163B. It's nearly two weeks later, and this is some 70 miles away in an area known as the Ponds in Chapel St. Leonard's. I've, I've been coming out to Chapel for the last three years, you know, to fish these ponds, right? And uh, roughly around nine o'clock, a car come down, you know, pretty fast and went over the speed ramp, which I don't think he knew were there. There were three men inside. And I know it's a dead end down bottom. And I just thought it was a bit funny, like, why he should be coming down at that speed. Then, within minutes, it, it come back up on its, you know, with just a driver in it. And I just thought, oh, he must have dropped some workmen off. You know, didn't think no was really funny about it at the time, right? Robin Hood Leisure, Robin Hood Leisure, Maid Marion Club. The maid Police now believe the occupants of the car were rehearsing a plan involving a caravan park the half a mile away. In the, warmest and sunniest spot in Lincolnshire. the Robin Hood Leisure Park is owned and run by two brothers. We pride ourselves on being a family business. 
We've been here a long time, uh, 33 years to be exact. We moved here in 1962. My father bought the business in those days and, uh, and we ran it as a family until he uh, sadly passed away a number of years ago. We have since expanded the business since then uh, to its present size today. Yes, it's uh, quite a large site now, about 750 caravans uh, with various activities and interests on the site, shopping centre and amusement arcade, large theatre club, which is very popular in the summer, and a lot of the people, the customers, come back year after year. In fact, there's a lot of customers actually, that they're very proud to tell us that they've been coming for 20 years or more. I love the job. I really love the job. It's ever so nice to meet so many different people. There's no two days are alike because of the variance of the job that we have. One day I could be working in the office, uh, another day I'll be working behind the bar or working out on the site. But I just love meeting people and I, I love making people happy. On that particular day, it was a very warm morning and we set off to go to the bank as usual. Right, it's three pounds fifty per week per adult. Hello, this is oh, what about him doing? Would you excuse me? me a moment, please? Yes, you're coming through loud and clear. Just go to the bank, be back in around twenty minutes, so see you then. Okay. See you then. Sorry about that. It's no, fine. As I was saying. We were more aware probably of security. Um, as during the last week or so we'd, we thought we'd been followed to the bank so it made us a little bit more careful. We drove along down to the bank watching the rearview mirror. Watching the mirrors all the time, yes. And we got to the bank without anything happening. Come on, can I have some oranges please? Oh, it's five or seven today. All right, okay. okay. Thank you. I think we arrived at the bank probably about ten past ten. It takes us about five minutes to actually get there. You got the pain in, Bucky? Ah, yes, I have that. Keep on, give me the box. Come on, drop it! Drop it! Just give me the box! I was absolutely flabbergasted. Dumbstruck. It's, it's as if you're walking in a dream and you don't think it's actually happening to you. It can't be happening to you until it actually does. Don't move! Just stay there! Give me the box. Just don't Keep do anything! Give me the box. Come on! Drop it! I was absolutely transfixed by him. And uh, I don't know what came over me. I just picked the trolley up and threw it. Unfortunately, it missed him. And if I'd thought about it, I could have given him a good kick. The robbers drove back towards the pond. They were fishing away. The car come down again really fast. But there was three people back in the car. And at this time, I thought there was something strange, you know, and there was something going off. The Fiesta was abandoned in the car park at the end of the lane. The robbers were last seen running towards the village of Inglemel. I find it very disturbing that uh, crime has come to a village like Chapel St. Leonard's. I feel sadness, anger, both together. I am a very trusting person, I always have been. It's made me less trusting, uh, more apprehensive, I would think, um, to everybody. Um, that is to say, it's, uh, it's had a detrimental effect on my outlook on life, I'm afraid to say. Um, yes, I would agree with that. Well, Phil Carter, I should make the point, first of all, again, that the two brothers have now completely revised their security arrangements, haven't they? Yes, they have, and there have been a, n a number of other companies on the coast in, in that particular area who have also done that as well. Mm. But where do you think those robbers went after they abandoned the car? Well, as you see, where they abandoned the car, they ran down, then ran down a path. That path leads to a car park uh, known locally as Vickers Point. 
there's several pubs in that area and amusement arcades. And we think they either got into another vehicle, and if they did, I'd be grateful to hear from anybody who saw them get into that vehicle. Or they may have gone into one of the many caravan sites around that area. There's no doubt, of course, that it was that fiesta that was involved in the robbery. Yes, that fiesta was stolen on the 11th of August. Again, I'll be grateful to hear from anybody who saw that, uh, that fiesta between the 11th and the 22nd when the robbery took place. We have had two previous sightings of that vehicle. You need more. Yes. You think there may be another car involved too, a red one? A red Vauxhall was seen near to the scene of the robbery and after the Fiesta was abandoned near the ponds, another Vauxhall, another, well, a similar Vauxhall was actually seen to turn round in that area and witnesses thought that it was in fact connected. Where do you think these men are from? They didn't, uh, they didn't disguise themselves in any, in any way other than they changed public clothes when they left the, after they'd left the Fiesta. Uh, so they're, they're obviously not local. There's a, a great possibility that they are from the Northamptonshire area. And again, if anybody can, uh, can give us any help in identifying them, again, I'd like to hear from them. The lack of disguise does at least mean you have very good descriptions of them. Yes, we do. The man with the gun is aged 25, 30 years. He had dark hair swept back. It was even possibly permed and he wore a light-coloured T-shirt. And the second one was about five years younger, thinner, and he wore a brightly coloured bandana or a baseball cap with the uh, peak reversed to the rear. Um, he, he was rough-looking, and he was, he was actually very nervous, he was, whilst the, the, the chap with the gun was, in fact, quite calm. Mm. Well, thank you very much. The, robbers, uh, the, the two brothers have put up a reward for the right information. If you can help, please ring us. The number here is 0500 600 600, or you can ring Mr Carter's colleagues back at Skegness CID. The number there is 0754 76 222. That's 0754, the code for Skegness, 76 222. Calls are building up this evening. Almost all our lines are busy at the moment. Uh, the, on photo call, it does look as though we might have now the whereabouts on two of those cases and some pretty strong sightings, possibly. We're not sure on one of them, on the other two and, uh, as well. On Jamal Mahmoud, two different names have been given as a result of the EFITs. Though I have to say at the moment, we've nothing more to go on except that uh, these names appear to fit very much the pictures, the descriptions that we have. Let's hear now some brief appeals, cases that could be solved tonight by Crime Watch viewers. Here with Incident Desk, our Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Haynes. If you live in North London, you may be able to help with our first case. Take a look at these two men. They raped a young woman on the 3rd of September last year in Finsbury Park. Since then, she's been attacked twice more. The first man is about 30 years old, six feet tall, with a heavy muscular build. He has a distinctive hair lip on his right side. The second man is in his late twenties, about five foot eight, with white blonde shoulder length hair, and he's thought to own a Jack Russell Terrier. The rape happened in Finsbury Park over a year ago, and we're now anxious for your help. Look carefully, and if you recognise them, or can help in any way, please call the incident room in Stoke Newington on 071 488 5212. That's 071 488 5212. Have you been offered a, a distinctive bracelet like this in the past two months? Or maybe you've seen a Midland Bank cash point card in the name of M. L. Gomez. If so, you may be able to help our London colleagues solve a murder. Marina Coppel lived in Chilton Street, central London. On Monday the 8th of August, her husband was trying to contact her for much of the day. By that night, he'd called the police. Officer, we've got a murder scene here, over. What do we know so far, John? Her name was Irina Coffle. She was 39 years old. Her husband couldn't get her on the phone, so he came round. And he found the body? Yeah, just in here, in this bedroom. Marina had lived in Marylebone for some time. Marina, she was a very nice lady. Paul's preface for Marina. She's been coming into the shop for 10 or 15 years, probably. Oh, yeah. Fine, how are you alive? She always had the same, which was egg, bacon and tomato. So, so, did you have a good weekend? Yeah, As a customer, I would say that uh, no, she was the nicest um, and more pleasant person you could find. <laughs> Can I have my usual Yes, sir. Yeah. I just can't imagine her doing any harm to anybody. Marina Coppel was uh, 39 years of age. She came to London from Columbia about uh, 15 years ago and for the past seven or eight years had been practicing as a prostitute. She advertised her services as a masseuse 
in a number of local newspapers, as well as publications like What's On. She changed her first name and may have been known as Sandra, Rosita or Maria. She was also known, as far as surnames are concerned, as Gomez, Angira or Angerita. We have spoken to some of her clients, but it is important that we speak to all of them. And we would obviously prefer that those persons made themselves known to us. On Monday the 8th of August, one of the last people to see Marina was her neighbour. My name is Mrs Miller. Oh, I'm Marina. How do you like your new flat? Oh, I love it. I just moved in two weeks ago. Have you found shops yet? Oh, she was my new neighbour. I thought it was a good time to have a chat. I thought she was very pleasant, very bright, and Marina offered to do shopping for me if I needed any. As she had a car and it would be no trouble for her. I never saw her after that. Later that afternoon, we know that Marina went to the Midland Bank at Baker Street, where she can be seen on the security video. After that, we know little of her movements, uh, but what I would ask for is that if anyone spoke to her, if anyone saw her, or indeed telephoned her that day, I would ask them to make themselves known to us. Marina telephoned her family in yeah. Colombia, uh -huh. um, and we know nothing about her movements oh, no, no, after that no. time, other than later that day, approximately within the coming eight hours, uh, she was okay. murdered. Nearby, in Bickenhall Mansions, not far from our scene, a blood-stained piece of blue cloth Steve, was found. Over here. It measures approximately 30 by 30 inches, and it's probably best described as a small tablecloth. It may be that it's not connected with our inquiry, but it's important that the person who put that cloth uh, under the car comes forward. Cases uh, concerning the murder of prostitutes are notoriously difficult to investigate. Um, we understand that people are reluctant to come forward and give information, and of course they have their own reasons for not to do so. Uh, but this was a particularly brutal murder and we do appeal to the public to come forward and help us. Marina had been repeatedly stabbed in a frenzied attack. Several items were missing from her flat. Among them is this Midland cash point card in the name of M. L. Gomez. It's been used three times since her death. If you've any information, please ring. There was also an NEC P3 mobile telephone, serial number 0216 00 13032. That's 0216 001032. The number would be on the back here. And finally, do you recognize this distinctive titanium bracelet? In fact, officers had to get this replica from America. If you can help in any way, please ring the incident room on 071 321 6754. That's 071 321 6754. This is Riddlesdown Common in Croydon. Since February 1993, it's been the scene of four serious sexual assaults on boys. <coughs> the most recent attack happened on Wednesday the 7th of September. The boy, a black 11-year-old, was seen with this white man entering a footpath opposite the Rose and Crown pub between 8 and 8.15 a.m. Perhaps you saw them. We're also keen to speak to a woman who passed them on the common around this time. A man, possibly the attacker, was spotted again just before nine o'clock at the bus stop near Kenley Police Station on Godston Road. This is on the 407 bus route. Did you see them here? Take a look again at the... He's around 40, 5 foot 10, with slim build, dark brown, bushy hair and stubble. He wore a long black, slit black and white check shirt like this one and light blue or grey trousers. If you recognise the man or can help in any way, please call Croydon Police on 081 667 1212. That's 081 667 1212. And finally, do you recognise this man, despite the fact that he's wearing a wig? On Saturday the 17th of September, he robbed the Quick Save supermarket in Blockswich near Walsall. At around 3pm, together with an accomplice, the robber forced the chief cashier to open the shop safe. They then escaped with a large amount of money. Take another look at one of the robbers. 
He's in his late 20s to early 30s, five foot nine, heavy build with a pockmarked complexion. He was wearing a dark blue suit, which was too small for him. His blonde hair and glasses are probably a disguise. A shopper noticed him earlier in the afternoon with short dark hair. If you know who he is or can help in any way, please ring the incident room on 0922 439 113. That's 0922, the code for Walsall, 439 113. And if you can help with any of those cases, there's the number 0500 600 600. That's 0500 600 600. After 10 years of Crime Watch, people on the team have got used to seeing the worst of human nature, and of course sometimes the best. Even so, it's hard not to feel angry at our next case, the terrible behaviour of a group of six drunk young men. The victim is an epileptic, and though her condition has seriously deteriorated since the attack, She's been able to provide detailed descriptions of the men. In fact, they're so distinctive that lots of people watching tonight should be able to help identify them. The victim lives in London, but her identity has been concealed. Sick. Where have you been? I don't know. Um, look, happened. Have you had a fit? I think so. Well, where are you now? I don't really know. Look, just find a cab and come home. Are you all right to do that? All right. I'll see you in a bit. Come on, let's get you inside. Hey. Where have you been? someone else's daughter not yours and all of a sudden it was my daughter she felt as if it was her fault because she's very hypersensitive and I I felt so frustrated and angry and sad my daughter's been there epilepsy since she was 14 and she hadn't been home more than 10 minutes and she went into seizure Fits are brought on by stress, and she was so traumatised that she just went on and on. I thought she wasn't going to come out of it. I don't remember much about the hospital at all. I've been told I had five fits on that day. Well, I've only have ever had two fits at the most in one day. But I reckon it's because of Saturday night. I must have arrived in Covent Garden around half eight. I met Emma and Sue there, and we went to a wine bar. We've been friends for ages, and I could see quite a lot of them. And we often go out and have a bit of a laugh. I can't believe it. Off Sue there. left around 11.30. I think she got the train. Emma was getting a taxi, and she left about quarter to 12. And, well, I hadn't finished my drink, and I needed to go to the loo, so I just waited around for a while. I always take my medicine with me everywhere I go, and um, I took my two nightly tablets there because I probably would have a fit if I didn't take them, so I have to make mm -hmm. sure I take them and everything. And then, uh, so I must have left about 12. Um, I can, I think I walked past the tube station and then I was walking up a road for about five or ten minutes, just looking for a taxi. I heard this car, and I could tell it was going quite slowly. 
there were, were lads in it and they were shouting. It's <laughs> all. What we got here? Oh, that's nice. Very nice. Right, darling. Come on, come on. 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 Let me just leave me alone. Come on, get in the car, I'll give you a lift. Look, I just want to get a taxi. Well, I don't want you to, all right? Get in the car. Yeah, get in the car. Go, go. There you go, go. Can you remember what car it was? I think it was an old red Volvo. Um, I saw that one of the headlights wasn't on, wasn't working or something. Um, and there were six men in it. And they were all drunk, and they were just laughing, and they were just shouting and, and sing, screaming and being really vulgar, you know? I didn't have a clue where they were taking me or which route we took. I remember that one of the men had half of his little finger missing. The seats were dark brown. Everything was very dirty. And the floor had a, a light brown carpet. In the back of the car, there was a small black suitcase and there weren't any headrests on the front seats. I think the car was still driving around when one of the men raped me. Are you okay to go on? Yeah. Just take your time. Mm -hmm. The, um, the first man The first man, he had a Prince t-shirt. It was black, it had long sleeves, and um, the Prince was on the front and the back, the print mm -hmm. of Prince. And it, it looked like he'd taken it to one of those shops and had his own t-shirt printed. Right. He was about 26, 27. He had short, dark hair, and he had some sort of scar or scratch under his bottom lip. He had a gold sleeper in his left ear, and I remember he was wearing a square signet ring with two initials. I think one of them was J. That's good. And I was just in the car, and I was saying to them, I was shouting to them, will you just please let me go? Will you please let me go? Please just let me go, and they were just, laughing they just i actually said to one of them i said what's wrong with you and he just said we're mad and then one of them lit a cigarette and he said what what should i do with this and then he said oh i've got an idea and he started putting it on my skin like really quickly and then taking it off we were still driving around when one of the other men raped me They'd put the back seat down and I was just thinking, oh God, just please let them stop. Please stop, please just let me go. The second man that raped me had very short blonde hair. He was about 27, 28, and he had a front tooth missing. And I started to get this funny feeling. You know, the feeling I get when I know I'm gonna have a fit. But then, I must have had a fit because I blacked out and I don't remember anything else. She's just so quiet now and just so down all the time. She's afraid to be alone. She's 22 years of age. She sleeps with me. If I move out of her sight, she wants to know where I'm going. She's afraid for anybody to touch her. She's lost all her confidence. And as for the, well, I won't even call them men. As for these males that did what they did to my daughter, animals wouldn't do what they did to her. Indeed, Royce Lost, this must be one of the most horrible cases we've ever covered. All those six men, they were all in their 20s. They all had very short hair and they all had strong Cockney accents. That's right. And you've actually got quite a good description of a, of a third, third of them as well. Yes, the third man, he's 22 to 23 years old. He's got very short, dark hair. He's of stocky build, and he possibly has a tattoo on his neck. On the night of that attack, he was wearing a yellow T-shirt. 
and we think one of them was called John. We know that one of them's got uh, half a finger missing. I mean, an awful lot of things to go on. And this car, red estate, possibly a Volvo. Yes, we think it was possibly a very old Volvo. The girl has described it. It's got a broken front headlight that wasn't working. It's got dirty seats, dirty brown seats, and light brown carpets. It was scratched. It gave the appearance of being a very old car. They might have got rid of it uh, since then. Of course, remember, this is Saturday 28th, Sunday 29th of, of May, so quite a long time ago. She was dropped off in East Putney, or at least that's where she woke up. Uh, how, tell us about the events there. She woke up, she thinks, about 5 o'clock in the morning. Yes, and we're not sure exactly where she woke up in Putney. Um, we believe it was somewhere off the Upper Richmond Road, near East Putney. She woke up about dawn, and we think she was found by a passerby sometime later, about 9 o'clock, who helped her to the offices of a minicab. OK, well, let's take a look at all three of the men, which we've got pretty good pictures of. The number here is free. It's 0500 600 600. Or you can try the incident room in London. That's 071 376 1212. 071 376 1212. Well, we've, got a lot, we've got a lot more calls coming through than I've got time to tell you about at the moment. We've had names suggested for the murder of Shamal Mahmood in uh, the Indian restaurant on the Orkney. And we've had uh, names for the two robbers at Chapel Street at St. Leonard's. Um, all the photocall cases I can see have got strong information on them and all the incident deck first cases we've got some names and there's one particular call on photocall that uh, police are following up right at the moment as we speak. But uh, for the moment that's it for this month. Do keep trying if you've had any information or if you know of anything you can help that you think might help. Our lines here are open until midnight 0500 600 600, one last reminder of the number and we'll be back with all the news we can give you in Crime Watch update at 11.15 except for viewers in Wales who'll be seeing us recorded half an hour later. If you can't stay up till then, well, thanks for watching, thanks for helping if you can and please remember crime is rarer than our reconstructions might make you feel. I forget arguments about statistics, even the most pessimistic picture shows that of all these people, only one would experience of any sort of contact crime, as it's called, between now and our next programme in November. Now, a contact crime is one where there's any even slightest physical involvement, and most of those cases will be fairly trivial. So don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well. Good night. Good night. BBC book to accompany the series, Crime Watch UK, is available now. The will to love. 119 kisses in all. The will to love. A comedy writer of the 16th century. The will for passion. Quickly, 51 daggers. The will for murder. Murder? Murder most foul. 49 murders, actually. The William Shakespeare. You've read the book, set the exam. Now meet the man, the bard. Coming soon to a box near you. On BBC Two, just two minutes away, verse for National Poetry Day. So, what did you do last night? Well, I went out with the lads, and then I um, went to the match. What did you do? I listen to Five Live. No one gets you closer to the action. 909 and 693 Medium Wave. Radio Five Live from the BBC. This is BBC One. Now, in Blackpool, it's question time. On question time tonight, 
the shadow chancellor, gordon brown.